Please put your dogs in the Dave Cameron Minutes, July 11th, 2016. Move it. All in favor? Okay. okay, on the consent agenda, I have items 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, and 4.4, and 4.6. <laughs> That's all right. I'll move the balance. Right. Move the balance. All in favor? Okay. So um, item 4.1, um, capital account closing report, July 31st, 2016. Thank you, Chair. Just very quickly, and just so by this, and I can probably handle both at the same time. My question on the insurance as well. Um, looks like we have an immediate $800,000 surplus. Reading this correctly? No. These this, are not these money. Are, this is capital. Right. So operating is what generates your surplus. Understood. But we, part of our operating budget is always topping up our reserves. So since we are already topping up our reserves by 800000 now from the closing these capital accounts, that to me means we don't have to use 800000 general levy to supplement reserves. Uh, through the chair, the principles of the capital expenditure policy is that some accounts will be over and some accounts will be short. So there are accounts that end up overspent mm -hmm. and there are accounts that end up underspent on the reserves. Correct. So when the account is finished, we re return the funds or fund the project from the given reserve. This is a picture of just 11 accounts. Right. There are a number of times we do three closings a year where f funds are needed to um, fund these various other projects. So there's the ebb and flow of those. We expect to have overages, we expect to have underages. Underages? <laughs> Under, <laughs> underspends. <laughs> you are. So, yeah. you so, so you need to have both of them to be mm -hmm. able to, um, to, to fund the accounts moving forward and keep the reserve Understood. in a good position. Understood. Do you recall what the surplus is for, the, or what the surplus or deficit was for the last? Excuse me. That, you report three times a year? Uh, no, sorry, I don't have that. Okay. I, and I don't recall, but I imagine that we're getting close to the end of the construction season, so a lot of those potential overages, I don't see a lot of those coming. Hopefully there won't be. I'm just pointing out that we're, we're definitely in a surplus position here to the tune of 800000 Even if the other two break even, one plus, one minus, if they're a wash, I think that puts us in a good position um, on this, but you're saying this one has no effect on the other, because I'm going to bring this back up again when we have our operating budget. Okay, now you have to remember too that the, d the reserves are funded for more than just the um, operating budget. They have right. slots revenue, yes. as well as they have ready revenue. revenue. And in fact, in these reserves you have on um, the DCs, which mm -hmm. have nothing to do with the general levy, there's over 400,000 there. In in the DCs, okay. And the federal ca gas tax is another 17000 So those are monies that don't come through, through our um, budget allocations from general levy. So you just have to be a little careful mixing and matching this mm -hmm. against surplus because this is really about reserves. And I understand there is some that are, um, some reserves that have money coming from them, but we also offset the overages from these as well. You'll, when you get uh, reports and we'll ask for additional funding, mm -hmm. you'll see those, uh, we'll there fund those one. from these. Yeah. Yeah. And then we use that money in those cases. And that's an overage you don't see here, you saw on a specific report. Thank you. Yeah, um, Council Brown? Uh, yes, uh, the road resurfacing fund is spent by 132000 and this also goes back into the reserve. But I was wondering if that amount could be added to the budget for 2017 so as we could resurface some more roads because of it getting behind in our resurfacing we've got put I believe we're putting less and less and less in the rest resurfacing budget. Um, actually our resurfacing budget is very consistent. Yeah. We have uh, a large amount that comes from both the um, uh, road maintenance reserve as well as the federal gas tax. It's you know it gets up close to two million dollars every year that we send spend on road resurfacing. But the amount that Ajax it has mm -hmm. been going down. The amount that eight well, the, the op comes from our operating, comes from the federal tax, mm -hmm. and what was the other one you talked the about? Road, the road maintenance yeah. reserves, that yeah. does go up, so we get we get the funding from the three sources, the slots for the, yeah. and the operating yeah. budget. But you got to understand the roads um, maintenance accounts, particularly the roads resurfacing, they're very dependent on timing. So when does, the, when does the tender go out? 
Um, what is the type of um, activity, like for instance, the year where there was Pan Am, pricing was very high. This year with an earlier tender, we got better pricing on them. So it depends on kind of what's going on in the year. And they have a plan, so they plan each year on the roads that need to be done. So they are completing those plans, which is the important things, and those are the priorities that are set, and they are completing those projects. I understand that, but uh, the, the plan for 19, what, 2000, whatever, if something happens, it gets pushed back, gets pushed back. If we added this amount to the 2017, it would be another couple of roads that could be resurfaced. That's my point. Uh, well, we tr when we, we do the road resurfacing budget, we look at the roads that are priority for that year and we fund those ones. We don't have it at a fixed number for each year, so we do look at the projects for the year and fund those projects. I know how it's done. <laughs> That's not my point. <laughs> because what happens is a road becomes more uh, advanced because of its conditions. So if another road gets pushed back, okay? They have a five-year plan, they have all these roads, mm -hmm. and if one road uh, progresses to deteriorate faster right. than the other, then that comes first. Mm -hmm. So. My point is, if we use that money, then we could do, do, do a couple of roads yeah. extra. How well, can we do that? How well, we the other part of that is that this has uh, under here, but at the same time, we have overs in, in other projects that we're doing that takes from that reserve. So it's always trying to balance those things. Right. Spending up to the cap each year, which is important for us to do, which we have been doing. Well. We'll no, I, I know, I know, it's very, very frustrating as a councillor when you see roads that are really in need of resurfacing and they say we don't have the money in the budget this year. But then we see this surplus in, in this particular year. That's what take up. Yeah. Just, just again, yeah, sure, that should never be a reason to not resurface a road. So um, it's more about fitting into the work plan so we've actually doubled the amount we've been spending on resurfacing from various sources so when federal gas tax came in and we, we did the financial sustainability plan we actually doubled the amount we're spending on on resurfacing so you should never get i don't know give you that commitment now that there may not be any money in that current year's budget but we do use our pavement management system that uh, that does track priorities and so on and, and, and the director of finance is correct sometimes that will spike up a fair bit because depending on the length of road but um you know, certainly in the middle of a year, you know, where a road comes to our attention, but you should never hear there's not enough money to fund that. If, it, if a road needs to be done, then a road will be done if it's got that, if it's that significant, because you're correct. We don't want to leave a road too long and all of a sudden we're doing a full reconstruction instead of a resurfacing. So I would certainly encourage you to bring any of those roads forward, you know, if there's something that, that perhaps have fallen, pardon the pun, fallen through the cracks, then <laughs> make sure we're around and that we're aware of us. So. But point taken. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Councillor Jordan, did you have a... No, no, no. Um, Sean, do you want to move that? I did move it. Okay, all in favor? Item 4.2. That's me. Just very quickly, again, we, our cost of the insurance pool is 1 point, well, we've got 1.32 million, uh, which represents a 7.4% increase, but earlier, talked about the dividend we received of 200 and something, 248,030. Mm -hmm. Is that 1.3 net of the, of the dividend? Um, no, they're separate. So one's the premium, the 1.3 is the annual premium for 2016, okay. 2017. And the 248 is the uh, surplus funds from um, the pool that's returned back. So even though it says it's a 7.4% increase, the fact we're getting that, that dividend back, actually means it's a decrease. Net. Well, we don't net, we don't net expenditures and uh, one-time revenues, okay? Like you can look at it overall that way, but at the end of the day, the expenditure is still 1.7. We'll continue to be increased and based on that number. Well, we kind of do, because the unbudgeted revenue of the 248,000 is included in the 2016 operating surplus. Yeah, it will be. And it's a one time. It's not like we get it every single year. Right, so, you know. It nets out. If, if you, yeah, it'll net overall in the operating budget surplus, absolutely. But you can't net them against each other. If you did that, you would have, I don't know, like a 20 or 30% increase if you tried to net those okay. two. I understand what you're saying. And, yeah. and you're saying don't count it in future years, kind of. Correct. It's a one time. Which is fine. And that's not my question. My question okay. was okay, even though, yes, the, net, the premiums themselves are going up 7.4. Mm -hmm. 
as a operation, we are actually, with the dividend, since we are at good risk, we are mm -hmm. getting, of course, that back. We're actually net. Yeah, that's it. Doing that's, okay. I just yeah, we're doing well. Yeah, yeah, and what it, the, the return on the money is the result of a good claims history right. throughout with the entire pool, managing the claims well and managing our risks well, and that's how we're getting that refund of money. Thank you. Were there any other questions on this item? Okay, uh, move it. All in favor? Item 4.3 on contract award, Church Street Bridge Design. That was you. Okay. Just uh, a question I'm wondering about uh, the contingency because I know with bridges often there seems to be different um, conditions put on the permitting through TRCA and so on. Is that something we've taken into consideration? <coughs> the, the, yes, that is usually one of the big variable factors is We've done an environmental assessment and we think we know what the TRC wants, but you know, sometimes it's been a couple of years since we did the environmental assessment and they might ask for additional work that we hadn't counted on. Count so that is a big contingency, yes. Well, I guess my, that's my question. Do we feel that 10% is enough? At this point, I do feel 10% is enough. There is a little extra room in the budget there. We're below budget right now, so if something else came up, we do have the budget to do it. A lot. I hope you're right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll move it. Okay, move it. All in favor? Okay, okay. Um, item 4.4, .4, final expenditure report, Carwood Cycling Facilities, Parking Improvements. I was um, surprised about the rain gardens that we have to have environmental compliance approval. And are we doing rain gardens? And I, think I, I just was surprised. Um, anything that connects to the storm sewer system, you need the ECA approval for. So there's a ditch and like catch basin there that connects to the storm system. So that's why it's needed. Hmm. I wasn't aware of that. Just it seems like an extra little layer of things we have to do that <laughs> seems unnecessary in my opinion. Have we um, made a comment about that? We just follow the compliance. Yes, they no, said they need to do it, so we, we did it. Right. Well, I think that's very right of you <laughs> to, <laughs> to follow <laughs> what you're required to do, but I really think that perhaps we should be making a statement. I mean, I don't know if the time or money is all, but it just seems the next thing we have to do when we're doing the right thing, and it's a garden. Mm -hmm. So if maybe we can, if there's something like that, bring it back, I might be happy to support that, because I think if there are things we're doing because of requirements that really seem unnecessary, that we're adding to costs and using staff resources, we should be trying to not do that. So, so the instructions to staff are? I think they're. You got it? You I would take it as direction in terms of you see your requirements for rain guards. Mm -hmm. Or any, maybe there's others that are beneficial storm weather works. Pardon me? Other beneficial storm weather works. Yes, yes, yeah. anything okay. else that you're aware of. Okay, thank you. Um, item 4.6, <laughs> um, amendment to the move it first. Oh, sorry, um, you're going to move it? All in favor? Thank you. So, item 4.6, um, amendment to the mandate of Ajax archives. That might have been me. I think and I don't, I'm not so sure that the question <coughs> is directed to um, this Chris. But anyway, and maybe someone else can answer it. Uh, we're, we are collecting a large number of items, I'm sure, just from what I saw at the anniversary and at other previous events. And I know even with DIL, as that became known, that submitting things and perhaps over time there will be more of those items. Do we, are we, and I'm sure it doesn't go to Brandon, are we looking ahead at some point to have a proper um, place to put these at the museum and that they're, they are kept in, in a proper place really and displayed because I think that the more 
people that start to hear about their history and so on as people move in, there will be more interest in doing that. I know it's a big expense, but are we looking down the road that that's on our, our list of things that we might want? Through the chair, um, we don't have anything formally in place. What we have asked is through the village uh, facility study is that some thought be given there in terms of the needs uh, study about uh, you, know, if, you know is it needed and what would be needed to make that available uh, in, in that area but certainly not as a standalone type of a facility that's not uh, um, i think on our mind i think the thought would be to, to like we've done with branch libraries etc is to, to put it in another bigger um, community facility so the, we feel that the village uh, repurposing I can't remember what we called that uh, would be the, the the opportunity to include that as part of the planning so I mean I'm not saying that it will be incorporated the idea is uh, can it should it uh, is there is there the, the, the demand to make it worthwhile um, there are a lot of small types of museums that you have to be careful don't can often not generate the interest that you that, you know some people think you know might have so it has to be dealt with very carefully in terms of uh, you know, what's the need and what's uh, you know what should be provided I agree and I don't know that the village is the spot either. I mean, I'm thinking of somewhere where there's more people that would be passing by such as the medallion um, that's going to be huge by the time it's finished but uh, and I know they have retail and storefronts that to me would be somewhere where people are gathered for other events. So I just put it out there. I don't expect an answer, but I, I would ask that people start start to think about that because I think it, it might be worthwhile in the future down the road. Is that a yes or no? Oh, good. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think more it's the environment very careful of because the you have a number of items that deteriorate without the right environment and I think that that for sure should be taken yeah. care of sooner rather than later the, because the long -term the story artifacts yeah. deteriorate. And I can say this Chris has done a lot of work in, in, in recent years in terms of environmental controls in the space that we have but it's not ideal by any means. That I think is the immediate. I think we need to to deal with that, the environment of some of our artifacts that are susceptible to deterioration. So that's what I'm coming for. Okay. Okay, move it. All in favor? Item six on presentation, appeal of the town's property standards, animal services appeal committee decision. Staff received a, a concern regarding a dog on dog attack. Staff investigated the incident, spoke to the witnesses, the appellants, the victims. As a result of that investigation, one of the animal services staff felt that for the public safety that an order to restrain should be issued against the dog. That order was um, issued to the Bannermans who are both present here today requiring that the dog be licensed, that the dog be kept on a chain of sufficient strength if it's in relation with the public. Otherwise, it can be kept in a, in a rear yard with the muzzle off, um, that the dog must be walked with a leash and muzzle, and must be kept under the full control of somebody at least 16 years of age and notify the town if the dog is relocated. Pursuant to the cat and dog bylaw, um, the Bannermans opted to initiate their right for an appeal in June of 2016. That appeal was heard before the Property Standards Animal Services Appeal Committee. 
the result of that appeal meeting was a vote of three to two to uphold the order as written. Um, and again, on July 15th, 2016, the Bannermans exercised their further right under the bylaw to appeal that decision before this committee. Um, it's staff's position that the officer appropriately investigated the incident and issued the order to restrain as a result of that investigation. And furthermore, staff believe that the Property Standards Animal Services Appeal Committee were well prepared, engaged, and thoughtfully heard the appeal for the order to restrain and made the decision to uphold after hearing all the facts of that case. I have included in your agendas the excerpts of the agenda that went before the committee, the minutes of that meeting, and the Bannermans also submitted a, an additional package to be submitted for this committee that's included in your package as well. And they've also um, provided the town with a, a video that they would like to show and they're here today to, to state their positions on why they feel that the order should be lifted. Um, just before we get to um, the applicants there, are, are there any questions of staff? Um, so Jared, just from a technical point of view, how many how many appeals are they allowed um, um, pursuant to the bylaw? Is this their final stop? Yeah, that is correct. They, um, two years ago, council agreed to amend the dog and cat bylaw to introduce a new appeal when appropriate fees are paid. Um, the Bannermans have opted, and this is actually the second time that somebody's come before this committee to ask for relief of this decision in the Property Standards Animal Services Committee. And uh, that's one other question. When you made reference to um, to, to the pet could be in the backyard um, unleashed and unmuzzled, I, I, I imagine that's with the gate? Correct. That's okay. making that's sure that the, yard. the animal's unable to escape, being okay. that gates have self-closing hinges and, and the bannermans have complied with that. Their fencing already has. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Would you like to address the committee? Okay. Should I start? Yeah. Okay. Bear with me. My husband and I are here today to ask that the order of the screen be removed from my dog bay home. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> what happens with the aid? Um, The events of that day in March do not require a lifetime order of restraint. There must have been many conflicting thoughts going through the minds of the committee members at the first hearing, because it took them over 90 minutes to deliberate, and in the end, the order barely passed. The committee members that voted yes based their decision on what might have happened in the future, not what actually happened in March. The injury to Kiev, which is the other dog involved, was not deliberate. From my perspective, the man that held Maple, our dog, in place and pounded on her nose was the one that inflicted the wound. If these men were not there that day, this whole situation would have ended differently. Maple did not turn and bite the man who was pounding on her nose. She waited for the chance to escape, which was all she could do. Since that day in March, Maple will not walk in our neighborhood during the day. She will only go out after dinner and only with my husband and I. I believe she remembers the beating she received and doesn't want to meet these men again. And they live just like a 30 second walk from my house. Maple was excited to meet Kiev as she recognized him as a dog from our neighborhood. She ran towards him barking excitedly, not with aggression. I supplied a short video of Maple playing with other dogs. I don't believe you've had a chance to view that yet. Basically, I just wanted to show how Maple likes to get other dogs involved in a game of chase, and that same behavior was seen that day when she approached Kia. She was not barking or uh, snapping or snarling, she was just excited barking. The video is just very short from my cell phone a year ago, just in case you had any questions of what that kind of behavior looks like. And the dog in question, it's one with the brown and white patches. Just a brief idea. I hope you 
you've had a chance to review the letters of recommendation from your neighbors and friends who have submitted on Maple's behalf. All of these people have seen their dogs interact with Maple and all of them without injury. All of these people and their dogs cannot be wrong. We came here today to be, to be the voice for Maple. We believe as our friends and neighbors do, this order of restraint is wrong. This is not a cut and dried case of animal aggression. The victim of an aggressive dog attack would have multiple bite marks. The dog may be picked up and shaken, but none of this happened. When the dogs were separated, I saw no blood, just saliva on Kiev's cheek. We feel that the order of restraint is not justified and should be removed. Maple did not approach Kiev aggressively, neither did she show any aggression to the man who straddled her and pounded on her nose. Many neighbors and friends can attest to the type of dog that Maple is. The committee in the original hearing could not come to a unanimous decision to remove the order or uphold it. If it was a clear case of dog aggression, the decision would have been swift, and it was anything but. For these reasons, the order of shame is just not justified in that case. Was there anything else you wanted to say to the committee? That sort of hopefully expresses our feelings on that. Okay, are there any um, questions for, uh, from the committee? Councillor Collier. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we've, we've heard lots of these over the years, and, and they're never easy, but so it's, you're saying that the injury to the smaller dog was the result of the, when it was pulled off by the other gentleman that intervened, that's well, when he, it was he never pulled her off. He straddled her mm -hmm. and pounded on her nose. Somehow that was supposed to give her, make her let go, but it, it essentially pounded the tooth through that dog's cheek. I guess the problem with having with this is the fact that the dog's cheek was in the dog's mouth to begin with. Well, what I think happened is that when Maple approached Kim, he probably got, felt threatened or was startled, didn't know what to do, so he probably snapped at her. And they, often when dogs are interacting, they're, they're sort of banging their jaws, lips are smacked, you know, flying around, and a tooth just even momentarily caught underneath the cheek, and it, with people pulling on leashes to try and separate, that ends up just making a tooth puncture. It was a very small incision. It was only, it had to be closed just with three little stitches. It's a very small space, which to me says it's a puncture, not a complete bite. If you look at other dog bite pictures, like the case I referenced in February, there's huge bites on that other dog. It was just a stray tooth caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. Okay. And I've had dogs. I've, I've walked them on its side. I know exactly where that video is taken. Um, I know how they act. and. Um, I can kind of see what you're, where you're going with it and how, but we weren't there. I don't, there's no way for me to know. Um, that's one of the questions. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Dice. Thank you. So I, I did read all the documentation and you seem to be a very responsible dog owner. I must say for a, a person to foster dogs has to be confident that they have control mm -hmm. in itself. In their house, <laughs> no less. Um, and also the tra training program that you went through with Maple, plus um, you know the letters of support. The only issue seemed to have been where there was a little bit of confusion and conflict was about if the dog actually did uh, start barking and go after Kia, and that's mm -hmm. where I had a problem. Mm -hmm. um, well. From my perspective, and knowing Mabel the way I do, she was excited to meet him. She sees she would see Kiev almost on a daily basis come by our house. So she recognized him as part of the neighborhood, just like she would recognize a neighbor or a friend, and she wanted to get to him to say hello. If, if she was aggressive, there would be snapping and snarling, and there wasn't. It was just barking excitedly. She just wanted to go say hi. Mr. Question for Mr. Hannon. I was also um, reading the, the part about the muzzling. Is there is there different ways of muzzling where the dog can pant when they're hot? Because that's how they cool down. Through the chair. Normally. Sorry. Through the chair. 
the requirements of the town when we issue a, a muzzle, it's always going to be a humane muzzling device. Whatever type of muzzle an owner chooses to purchase, the dog must at all times be able to <coughs> breathe and drink. Um, the restrictions that, that the mouth is closed is just incorrect. The mouth can open, it's just not to a point of being able to clamp, clamp down with any force afterwards. So um, wh whether it's the, the steel cage type, whether it's the cloth type, it's just as long as the dog can pant, breathe, and drink, the muzzle is appropriate. So how, how would it work when, um, as prior it was suggested, they had the two years of the trial period, does do you then have to, have to go back and go through this process again? And how do you gauge the two year? Through the chair. My, successful? I'm going to be speaking on behalf of what I thought the committee was trying to get at. There has been one previous case where the committee gave somebody an option to take the dog to obedience training. Mm -hmm. um, that that circumstance that the dog was out of control. It also bolted from the owners and wouldn't come. The committee at that time stated that perhaps they should go and get some additional training requirements, um, get better control of the dog, and if they fulfilled those requirements, then the committee would have allowed them to come back within the year to explain the process that they've gone through to ask the committee's relief at that point. I think that's what the committee was talking about when they were mentioning the two-year requirement. Um, that has been the one and only time the committee has given that option, but that was a case where the dog was out of control. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? My, my understanding is it's a lifetime, or is it, is it a lifetime muzzle? Okay. Correct. Um, what, what other options, or in addition to that, what, are, what other options are available to, um, to this committee? The committee has the exact same powers as the officer who wrote the order originally. You can modify the order in any which way you see fit. You can uh, confirm the order or rescind it completely that it, it doesn't exist. And anywhere in between, that's the committee's power. So, um, just in terms of the committee to understand the situation, what our options are, um, would anyone like to put forward a motion? I'll move the recommendation. The staff recommendations yeah. as it is? As it is. And I'll just state, I, I think um, Mrs. Benjamin and Mr. Yeah. Benjamin, you may be right. Yeah. However, I'm, the risk of you being out wrong is what's really need to be this. I'm worried that if you're not right, they may not again, even though from listening to you and so on, I think there is, uh, you may learn, but I, I'm, not, I I'm not convinced 100% that you are. <coughs> well, look, I don't think there's statistics that support that. Just like if I was driving down the road with a BT, that doesn't mean that tomorrow I'm going to get a pedestrian. It's just those things can't say one leads to the other without any question. I'm saying there's outstanding circumstances during this event that one, if those men hadn't been there, if you know, there's so many factors in there that they all just happened to line up that day and that was like, what happened? Okay. Um, so Councillor Jordan, before we vote on your on your um, on your motion, um, Councillor Collier, did you have um, I was just going to speak to the recommendation as well. Right, that's here. Just that, um, you know, it's a tough situation because we're, well, first of all, we appoint the, the Committee of Adjustment and the Property Standards Committee to make these decisions on our behalf as a Committee of Council. And um, to overturn that puts us in a very difficult position because if this dog ever did bite again, we're liability up to up to here you know they're going to sue the town they're going to sue us personally they're going to sue everybody um and and as a dog owner a previous dog owner i mean i i didn't think mine ever would and never did but you know you just never know what the situation is and, and i'm afraid that i can't put the town or myself in that in that situation so i'm going to vote to to uphold the order okay um before we vote um Ron, can we just get a, um, 
an opinion just in terms of what Councillor Collier said in terms of um, liability and being sued and if um, well through the chair I don't think there's any personal liability um, of course if there is you're fully protected through insurance with the town there's potential for liability on the municipality if you don't uphold the order and then the dog does bite again and does more serious damage than obviously what's occurred here so there's a potential for liability certainly okay okay so um Colleen will entertain your motion to, uh, oh, sorry. I have a question. Okay. So, Mr. Hannon, if um, there was another incident with, it, with any dog, uh, at what point is it recommended that the dog be put down? Because there have been cases of that. So is there, I guess, a risk of jeopardizing the dog in the future if there's another during that investigation that we do, the first preliminary investigation, all those things are taken into account of whether or not there's a history with the dog. Um, and, and if there was a history that, that showed that and, and a negligence on behalf of the owners, that may be a decision of staff at that time to go through a, for a destruction order in Udola. Um, but in this particular case, that wasn't warranted. That's not what staff felt appropriate. We don't have a history with the, with the Bannermans or any of the dogs that they've owned. Staff did feel that there was a liability, and, and what happened may happen again, and that's why they issued the original order. Right. Okay. So, um, Councilor Collier, you want to make a motion? Yeah, I would like to make a motion to approve the order of the Board of Trustees of the Town of Bannerman Park 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 and I do think your response is head on this, but I also fear that if there is an incident in the future and the dog's not less, we will lose the dog. So if you can find you know, a more comfortable way of, of doing that, it, it uh, will protect the dog in the future. It doesn't protect her from other dogs. Like it. When there's an incident. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Item, um, sorry, item seven on um, departmental updates. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just three updates with regard to new infill proposals that we are going to be probably seeing a little more of as, the, as time goes on and um, just in terms of applications that we've received over the summer. One's at the southeast corner of Kingston Road and Church Street, and it's a four story apartment building with 60 rental units and 12,000 square feet of ground floor retail. And that is essentially for four corners of the village. Um, another application that's coming over the summer is at 113 Old Kingston Road, which is the corner of Elizabeth Street and um, Kingston Road. Four story, 39 unit, a condo apartment with 2,500 square feet of ground floor retail. Um, finally, at the southwest corner of Salem and Mandrake, a one acre site that's proposed to accommodate 48 four story stack townhouses with an access from Angus Drive. So, so that last one was the southwest? Southwest corner of uh, the Salem and okay. Mandarin. Yeah. Yes. And it's 48 units. Um, be one acre okay. And what did that require in terms of approvals? Um, I'd have to look into that, but I understand it's a um, certainly a site plan application, but I understand that it is um, designated in zone. But um, I can check on the other. Thank you, Chair. Three to Mr. Mueller. What, um, which corner on Church and Two is that again? That is the southeast corner. So that, that is the old, old, old Hyundai repair. dealership. A lot of repairs, I guess. And what is that for again? That's for four story apartment building with ground floor retail. Is that so not a conversion? So yeah, that's, that's a rebuilding. That I believe is. Yes. Yeah. So what's the message? Do we like that idea? 
Um, it's certainly, <laughs> in terms of the, uh, I mean, this is the, the height and density central. for the site, that's correct. It's a four-story property, or four-story proposal, generally in keeping with the findings of the Pippin study, but I think the, the issue here will be the design sensitivity of, sensitivity of the building and how it responds to its heritage context. So this will be the, I'm trying to remember the plans that we, we approved looking so it's right up to the street that's correct storefront main floor yes. residential up top that's correct and it's more like not really like an apartment building more like brownstone sort of thing is there yeah what you would i mean four stories in height so it, it is an apartment kind of like walk but it's, it's not um, what you would think of you, as a typical apartment it, building it is similar in scale to a walk-up right. but right. it's it's mm -hmm. formatted as an apartment okay thank you the right thing thank you yep. Sounds like it's fitting with what we yeah. um, Council Jordan? Just the Elizabeth Street combo right here. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, four stories, 39 units, uh, 2,500 square feet of ground floor commercial space. And that's that about a half an acre. So we're fitting more on less than oh, so oh, oh, Where was that? Okay. That's at Elizabeth and Old Kingston. That's the old PAB site. Mm -hmm. The old PAB site, yeah. Did you have a question? For yes. I just wondered about the Finley Plaza. Um, that is not yet. Um, that has not been the subject of any pre-consultation, but there are. There has been discussions out there with regard to a potential um, reformatting or reuse of the old plaza on Finley, south of Weston Road to allow for up to four stories of, again, apartments with, I'm, and I don't, I don't know for sure whether or not there is a ground floor commercial component to that, but um, certainly it's a reuse of that particular property for something that's more intensive. And that would require rezoning? Yes. Mm -hmm. So we have be safe then? Yeah. Okay, so there's lots of, as you know, So how, how long would it uh, take to go through rezoning and uh, an OP amendment? I would say for each of these, you're looking at nine months to a year. Um, certainly for all of them, there's going to be um, a, a fair amount of um, public interaction and um, certainly more than one open house for both, I would imagine, as well. Um, so it depends certainly on the responsiveness of the applicant to address those comments and have them brought forward. So. I, I tend to earmark about that length of time for proposals such as this, but again, the process will start to dictate that a little bit as well. And because it's an infill site in the <coughs> residential area, which is really new for us, right. um, we can circulate uh, that public notice for meetings a lot further than we normally do. Um, we could. Um, in it's standard practice for us to sort of take a 400 foot radius around the property and, and circulate in that case. However, um, certainly through either social media or through um, our traditional approaches to the newspaper, we could canvas out a little wider as well. Certainly the two proposals in the village, there's going to be um, a heritage interest on both of them and um, more than likely a BIA interest in both of them as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Got nothing, Dave? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, okay, so I get a motion to move in camera. Okay.